Good morning, boys and girls. It's Thursday. We're start, we just started a new book yesterday called Poppy and Rye. And do you remember what happened? Poppy finally convinced Erith to go on a little trip with her because she would like to go share the sad news with Ragweed's mom and dad. Chapter three is called Night Thoughts. Erith moved along so fast, Poppy had to race after him. Her cries of, hey, slow down, wait for me, were to no avail. Only when they reached the deepest part of Dimwood Forest did Erith finally pause. When Poppy caught up to him, the porcupine was calmly nibbling on some tender bits of bark, which he had peeled from a tree. It was a dusky place. The high trees kept the light out, but not the heat. The air felt as thick as syrup and bore a smell of skunkweed and rotting mushrooms. What is this spot? A panting puppy added, throwing herself down on the ground to rest. Though she had always known Dimwood Forest was big, she was beginning to fathom just how small a part of it she had experienced. The forest, Erith replied smugly. Amazing, Poppy said, staring around. Now look here, Erith said. Where was it that you said you were going? Poppy, still breathing hard from her exertion, said, it's called the brook. Oh, flip flop, the porcupine growled. There must be a million brooks in this forest. Are you saying that's the only name you have? Erith, Poppy said, all Ragwood told me was that the was west of the forest. Sticky roach toes, Erith muttered. According to that, it could be anywhere. No, it can't, Poppy pointed out. It's not east or north or even south. It's west. She looked toward the sky. Though the sun was hidden behind heavy foliage, it was still possible to find its place in the sky. Since it's afternoon, she said, west must be that way. Fine, Erith conceded, but how are we supposed to know which brook it is? Erith, Poppy said, we don't need to have all the answers, do we? Can't we just keep moving? We've got all the time we need. The faster we get there, the faster we get back, Erith said. Poppy got up and started off this time taking the lead. Erith, muttering, ragweed under his breath, followed. <coughs> Excuse me. The two friends traveled side by side, moving in a steady westerly direction. Speaking little, they did not stop until darkness came. They had come upon one brook, I think we'd better find a place for the night, Poppy suggested. She was quite worn out. When I travel, I stay in trees, Erith informed her. That's fine with me, Poppy assured him. Pick out one you'd like. Can't be any tree, you know. Has to be comfortable. Fine. Right height. Good. And smell right. Just choose one, Erith, Poppy cried. Constantly grumbling, Erith lumbered about the forest floor, examining every tree he passed. Poppy followed, pausing now and again to nibble seeds when she found them. It made little difference to her where she slept. As long as she was with Erith, she was safe. 
Nobody wanted to mess with him or his quills. The porcupine finally settled on a flat tamarack pine. Its branches were thick. Its smell was pungent. Moving awkwardly from branch to branch, Erith climbed. Poppy followed. Halfway up the tree, Erith came upon a particular flat branch whose broad width at the point where it grew out of the main trunk made a platform. I suppose this'll do, he said, and settled down. Mind if I snuggle in, Poppy asked. Snuggle, Erith mocked. Why don't you just say, mind if I lean on you? I prefer snuggle, Poppy said with a grin. She settled herself between Erith's front paws, curled up in a ball, and took a deep, relaxing nap. Though the air was ripe with a sticky scent of pine, Poppy detected the smell of nearby blossoms. Loving flowers of any kind, she was happy. And here the two are. You can see Erith. And if you look really, really close between his two front paws is Poppy. She's kind of teeny tiny compared to him. The night was full of noises, too. She heard the soft, padded steps of animals, the slithering of snakes, the piping of frogs the chirping of crickets. Now and again, leaves rustled in the breeze. The night is dancing, she thought. The stars seemed so distant. How far, Poppy wondered, would she have to travel to reach one of them? Letting slip a murmur of contentment, she nestled closer to Erith. She was perfectly aware he was not the easiest of companions, but she loved him for the good, blunt friend he was. Besides, whether he meant it or not, he kept her mind off the sad part of this journey, the meeting of Ragweed's parents. So far, the trip was exactly what she wanted. She could already sense her grief easing. She was convinced that once she saw Ragweed's parents and delivered her doleful news and his earring, she would be able to return home and get on with her life. The thought soothed her. She began to drift off to sleep. Eva broke the silence. Poppy, he growled, when you tell Ragweed's parents what happened to him, I won't be around. Oh, why, Poppy said with a yawn. Because it's just family fripple, that's why. I hate all that garbage. Erith, you can do what you want. I do, Erith said, always. Fine. Poppy yawned again and closed her eyes. Then Erith said, it's all those stupid feelings. Porcupines, get along without that bunk. Not one feeling? For salt, maybe. When Poppy made no response, Erith added, it's better that way. How come? Poppy asked sleepily. Oh, chipmunk cheese, it just is. Poppy was too tired to debate. Instead, she pondered what she might say to Ragweed's parents, wondering if they would blame her for his death. Yawning, she placed her tail under her nose and was soon fast asleep. Erith stared into the dark. This is dumb, he said to himself. I never should have come. Ragweed, he sneered. Nothing but ragweed, nothing but sugar mouse slops, fooey.
goodness. I think, I think our friend Erith has a bad attitude, don't you? Wonder why. Maybe he's never had a friend before. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Chapter four. <clears throat> the water rises. The beavers built the dam higher. Inch by inch, the water rose. It licked the low banks, then swallowed them whole. It crept and crawled and poked into every crevice, filling them up. It trickled along animal paths and washed them away. It sank flowers and grasses and turned them into soup. It slid between bushes and trees and drowned them, root, leaf, and branch. It made islands of low hills. It flooded nests. The water was unstoppable. Though Clover and Valerian could observe the water rising with their own eyes, they found it hard to accept that their nest was doomed. After all, they had lived in one place for years. During that time, how many storms had they weathered? How many droughts? How many cold winters? To all the questions, same answer, many. Why are the beavers doing this? The children ask. Be fair. Valerian said with a catch in his throat and a harassed look on his face. We don't own the brook, do we? Don't you think beavers have as much right to live here as we do? But their pond is getting huge, one of the children objected. It's taking over everything. Valerian sighed. Maybe I can talk to them. So it was that Valerian, feeling apprehensive, trying to keep his gray whiskers neat, crept down to the shore of the newly created pond. The old brook had been surrounded by many trees. The new pond was encircled by chewed off and jagged stumps. The old brook had been tranquil. The new pond fairly rattled with beavers hard at work. Even as Valerian stood there, he heard the sound of yet another tree crashing. He winced. Hello, he called out across the pond. Can I speak to someone? One of the beavers paused to look around. Hey, old timer, what's up? I'm fine, thank you, Valerian returned politely. Who are you? The beaver asked. I, I live here. Do you? That's cool. What's happening, pal? I'd like to speak to Mr. Cannon. Cass? He's probably busy, but I'll go check. The beaver dove, leaving Valerian to pace nervously, tail wagging in agitation. Within moments, Mr. Cannon burst up to the water's surface. Hey, pal, nice to see you again, he cried out. Don't think I got your name. Valerian, thou right. What's up, pal? Well, sir, it's this pond you're building. Sight for sore eyes, isn't it? The beaver boomed. Well, I was just wondering how I mean, no one owns the brook. So of course, naturally, we're, we're obliged to share, but we, well, we were wondering just how, well, big you intend to make it. Big, Mr. Canad cried. Tell you something, pal, you ain't seen nothing yet. Talking world-class pond here. The cat's pajamas and meow in combo. Over the top, major league, the whole enchilada. Hey, pal, Canada and company don't do small. But Valerian said plaintively, if you make it too big, 
you'll drive us folks who live here away. Look here, pal, Mr. Cannon said. I'm, I'm telling you, I'd be tinkle pink to see you stay. You seem decent, clean, good manners, not a troublemaker, are you? No, sir. Great. Glad to have you around. Progress without pain, that's our slogan. But if you have to move, well, hey, no problem. Have a great trip. Bon voyage, hasta la suista. Our, 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 our revoir, our revoir. Oh my. Can we compromise, Valerian pleaded, so we can both stay? Pal, I've put quality time into that question. Comes to this. Beavers do what beavers do. There you are. Question in. Answer out. Neat as a pin. Hey, nice talking to you, pal. Appreciate it. Really do. Have a nice day. I mean that sincerely, he cried and dove beneath the water. Valerian, more discouraged, discouraged than when he went, returned to the nest. What did they say, his children asked. We have to move. So Valerian and Clover began a frantic search for another suitable home. It was not easy. In the best of times, good nests were hard to find. Now they had waited too long. Many creatures caught in the same predicament as they were already gone. When the mice finally found an acceptable new home, it was on a hill cresting the ridge overlooking the new pond, a small damp hole with a large cold boulder for a roof. The boulder was perched precariously atop the hill. As Valerian considered it, he worried that it wouldn't take much to set it rolling. That brought nightmarish visions of it tumbling away in the night, leaving his children exposed. Clover said, it'll have to do. And there is the big boulder with the little area underneath for them to make their new home. I reckon it will, Valerian agreed, trying to hide his worries. Neither one mentioned that fifth fitting 13 children into one dank, chilly nest was going to be difficult. Yet even after they had found their new quarters, they put off moving it was too painful. Only when water began to trickle down their long entryway and make puddles in the middle of their main room did they finally pack their belongings. These belongings, already middle-wed and sodom, were easy enough to gather and haul out of the tunnel. Much harder was the removal of their children. Do we have to move? The first complained. But Ma, said another, what about my friends? Well, I'm sure that anyone who has had to move can make a connection here, especially the part, what about my friends? It's always hard uh, to move to a new place and think about having to make new friends. <clears throat> the water isn't that bad, said a third. We can make rafts, build a boathouse, swim from room to room, be cool. And a fourth, do you really, 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 really promise we'll come back when the water goes down? D 
dear, dear children, Clover said, trying unsuccessfully to keep back her tears. We have to go. Of those children who still lived at home, Rye was the eldest. Like all the golden mice, he had fur of an earthly orange color, a tail that was not very long, small round ears, and youthful downy whiskers. He did have a small notch in his right ear, but that was the result of a childhood accident. Rye had never left home. He claimed he stayed behind to help his parents and the youngsters. Other suggested it was because he enjoyed being the eldest, which he became once Ragweed had left. Rye, Valerian said, take yourself and some of your siblings and go search out the rest of the family. Let them know your mother and I have moved to a higher ground. Tell them where. Rye's chest swelled with pride that it was he who had been called upon to inform his far-flung family about what was happening. Thistle, his by one litter younger sister, squeaked, do we have to go to everybody? She wasn't even sure how many brothers and sisters she had. Absolutely, Valerian insisted, all 63. Now do hurry, Rye, Clover said. It's urgent. Hearing the distress in their parents' voices, Rye, Thistle, and a younger brother, Curly Doc, sped off to do as they were told. Later that day, the family moved. When the children were all out of the nest, Clover and Valerian took one last lingering look about their old house. Side by side, she short and plump, he tall and thin, they held pause. Suddenly, Clover said, Valerian, what about ragweed? What about him? Who's going to tell him where we've gone? Valerian pulled his whiskers. Clover, love, I'd say that when and if Ragweed gets back, he'll see for himself that things are changed. That's all. What do you mean if, Clover asked? Just saying. If ever we had a smart child, it's Ragweed. He'll find us when he comes looking. Clover and Valerian scampered out of the nest. Within hours, their old home was entirely under water. Wow. <clears throat> that's, that's, that's not good. The family had to move, and um, Poppy's trying to find him, which I guess the move isn't going to matter because she really doesn't know where to look anyway. But uh, hopefully she'll find him, and, and uh, we'll have to see what happens when we read tomorrow. Have a good afternoon. Bye.